Welcome to the Touching Gloves podcast, where we talk about all things MMA with a faith-based flavor. I'm Kevin Lehman, and I'm a pastor here in Wilmington, North Carolina, and I'm here with my good friend, Joe Selecki, UFC lightweight fighter. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, sadly, our UFC fanboy is out today. <laughs> Caleb Fisher is on vacation in Maryland. He deemed that more important than what we're doing here. So we'll miss him, but uh, we've got a great guest to fill in for him today. We've got Alan Branch, who is, and I'm going to let you introduce yourself here in just a second, but Alan Branch is a kickboxing coach. He is Joe's personal striking coach, it gets him ready for all the, the cool UFC bouts and things like that. So um, we've got him here to talk to us about a few things. So today we're going to cover... We're going to cover. Uh, we're going to first. We're, well, we're going to let Alan introduce himself as 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 what kind of got him into kickboxing and, and coaching kickboxing. Um, we're going to discuss what are the best martial arts for self defense, and I'm sure there will be some opinions, right, Joe, yeah. going around the the table here. Uh, I'm still a big fan of being able to fight somebody in a phone booth with the chain punch, but <laughs> and, and I'm sure that will come up. Hence some, the poster behind you. Yes, yes John Claude Van Dam, who's the the king of self defense in the in the eighties. Is he really? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would love to talk to you about that. I would love to talk to you about that. Um, we're also going to get to the struggles in coaching fighters. So Alan's been doing that for how many years, give or take? Twenty. 20 years coaching professional and amateur fighters. And Actually, so, it's a little bit late. Ah, it's longer than that. Yikes. Maybe more like 25. Man. It's amazing you, you, you just, have all your hair. <laughs> isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's 100%. a trick to that. Y'all let me know if you want to know what that is. I would love to know what that is. The problem is I've already lost a lot of mine. <laughs> yeah, so. there, there is a trick. You I think that the trick is just learning to wear a hat well. What no, do you think? Because I actually have my hair and I wear a hat too. So okay. there, there is a trick. We'll talk about that maybe in another podcast. <laughs> okay. All right. Maybe well, today. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so we're going to talk about the, the struggles of coaching fighters, and then we'll get to the intangibles that a fighter must have, at least in Alan's opinion, to participate in and do well and excel in combat sports. And then is combat sports the right? Yeah, I that think so. Because so aggressive when I was writing it, but yeah, either well, you or Caleb used that. Yeah, it was me, I think, because... If we're going to talk about MMA, that's one sport, but you have kickboxing, you have boxing, uh, you know, back in the day you had karate competitions, you have jiu-jitsu wrestling, like, because I think they're all very similar across the board, you know, uh, at least when you're looking at like what it takes to be successful in them, you know? I see. Okay. All right. Combat sports. I love it. We're rolling with it. And speaking of rolling, we're going to talk about what role does taking your uh, care of your soul have to do in fighting? Because we, you know, we always want to bring in our our faith-based flavor into the show. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that too with Alan. So that's what we got on the docket for today. We hope you enjoy the show. All right, Alan, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you, man. Yeah. Glad to have you. Um, we understand that you coach this guy. Is that right? Are you, you trying? How's that going? It looks like it. Yeah. Make me take a lot of ibuprofen every <laughs> week afterwards. No, yeah, I am. and Because uh, he gives I, you headaches or because your body aches? <laughs> no, because I... <laughs> Maybe both. No, <laughs> neither. Kevin's like, we're, I take a lot of ibuprofen after our lunches <laughs> together. Good. I'm like, <laughs> right. I'm seeing a common theme here. <laughs> so yeah, and another sponsor uh, with the tapeworm. By it, the way, it's been a uh, it's been a lot of fun already in a couple months. Yeah. So this will be. Is this the first fight that you've gone from like fight announcement to the fight with Joe? No, the first one. I think last time we were like a couple weeks, like maybe it's like three or four sessions. You know. You only had three or four before sessions. we got the fight announcement. No, then we did the full. Oh, camp. oh okay. Yeah, we made. I think we only had like ten workouts, ten or twelve. Workouts he was the total. one that told me to raise up real high and let him counterhook you and drop you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, that was my old habit. That wasn't. No, I think so. probably the best input that happened from the little bit of time that we had before was increasing the frequency yeah. of striking. So you're you're striking, not to get ahead of things, but you're striking. It should be like a rhythm, and if you're like one. One, you know, yeah, that's yeah. not a very high frequency. So we try to get you to put in twos and threes and increase the amount of frequency throughout them. And I yeah. think that stuck and that paid off in that final round. I know that this joke is getting old, but the frequency of a chain punch. You got to stop I, with that. No, I mean, I'm serious. You consider how many significant strikes you can get in in, in just okay. a couple of so, seconds. So, no, no. The, the problem is you're using the word significant strikes. Yeah. Oh. You can't classify a, 
this as significant. <laughs> there might be a lot of them, but there's a lot of gnats flying around. They don't really yeah, do a lot to you. It's you. like a lawnmower. You just, you mow people down with it. But anyway, I'll, I'll show you guys that. At I some didn't point. know it was that type of podcast. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it is. Uh, it is very much that type of podcast. People love the chain punch jokes. I, I get asked about it all the okay. time. In the I'm just gym. glad we're acknowledging their jokes. That's good. That's and what if they've never heard this before and they don't know what a chain punch is? Yeah. Just watch a Steven Seagal movie. Nope. Steven Seagal doesn't chain punch. Man, it's <sighs> close enough. Yeah, man. you watch like It Man if you want to really see chain punching. <laughs> okay. Or Bruce Lee, so, maybe. Check them out. It Man, <laughs> Bruce Lee movies. There's a reason why you don't see it Joe's in any reality. Joe's terrified of Bruce Lee. In any yeah. reality-based uh, sports. Through. All right. Well, let me ask you this then. All right. Since y'all are still going to be haters, how did you get into coaching kickboxing? Like, how did that even become a thing for you? And we want like the two to three minute version, not the Alan's life story version. Well, dang. I know. I'm sorry. (laughs) Okay. So you want me to just bullet point it? Uh, Sadly enough, it starts because I was beaten as a child. And then, truly, it does. <laughs> okay. And then it's at, not funny. at uh, 15, uh-huh. I kind of decided I wasn't going to get beaten anymore. So I saw Rocky II on okay. a black and white TV right. that was about this big in yeah. my bedroom. Okay. And started trying to learn to box. So before I had a bag, I scourged a pair of boxing gloves and I wished to punch the concrete wall in my basement because I didn't have anything else to hit. <laughs> With gloves on. And then uh, learned, started fighting a tough man contest with no real training. I was kind of training myself. I was okay. creating drills before I knew what they were. Then I ran it. I met a guy that worked in a freight company with me, and he was a uh, black belt in Gojiru. So we started a little bit with that. And what I saw out of him was kind of like a rhythm, uh, kind of a rhythmic like style where I started seeing there's like a fighter's rhythm type thing. Then I met a guy, Alan Jacobs, who was my first trainer i'm his senior student he was actually whitney houston's actual bodyguard wow he was on wow. the pilot so it of, wasn't kevin costner no it was okay. not kevin costner <laughs> All right. alan was wow. on the things was, you learn on this show so he was <laughs> breaking he, news he had a uh so i worked for him in a furniture store so i was his sales manager of his furniture yeah. store so but he was the mild-mannered furniture store owner that uh was actually like a fifth degree black belt and like six different things uh was on america's okay. top bounty hunter Great credentials. Anyway, I was training with him, started in Taekwondo, a little bit of boxing. He introduced me to Joe Lewis. So met Joe Lewis one day. Uh, for some now, There's reason, two Joe Lewis's in the fight world, right? Yeah. So what are the differences? So was- the brown bomber, Joe Lewis, the black Joe Lewis, incredible boxer. Okay. Uh, the white Joe Lewis from Nightdale. He's actually from North Carolina. Nightdale, North Carolina? Yeah. Wow, that's actually, where my grandparents live. He actually coined the term kickboxing in 1970. Ah, okay. He was Bruce Lee's only actual student who competed. Okay. And uh, I met him at a seminar. Okay. And uh, we we can talk about that another time, but we got started, sure. trained together. Uh, I was competing then, getting coaching from Lewis. And uh, we, me and a friend were fighting in a tough man contest, and we won started winning. What is a tough man contest? So tough man contest is, and this, you got to go back before the North Carolina boxing commission. Okay. This was, it was in its infancy, just starting. Sure. So the tough man was whoever shows up. Okay. Is split into three weight divisions, 140 to 160, 160, 184, 185 and up. Wow. Right. Those are some pretty wide weight divisions. So 40, the, Mm -hmm. when we did it, 40, 50 guys will show up. Mm -hmm. You don't know if they have boxed, trained, untrained street fighter pro, you don't know. Okay. They divide everybody up. You show up, you show up on Friday night. They pull out. Alan Branch, come to the red corner. Kevin Lehman to the red corner. And then you fight. And if you win, you move on. And they do that all night long for the semifinal. Then the next night, whoever makes it comes back. Wow. And you fight, fight, fight until you're out of fighters, until you see who wins. What are you wearing for gloves, pads? anything like that. So these are some fun stories I can tell you. Okay. So, uh, in some of them you wore like legit, some legit boxing gloves, like 14, 16s, whatever. So you had some protection. Some of them provided a decent headgear. I fought in a bad man contest, which was the same thing, but allowed kicking. Mm -hmm. And what we did, we got there and I had, I put shin guards on. Right. And I looked up in the ring and they're fighting, uh, of course, no headgear, these tiny little gloves, (laughs) bare feet, no shin guards. And I'm watching, I'm going, I'm hey, these. so yeah. look, look, I got to have my, my, uh, blood sport moment. Yes. And so I had well, I my shin guards on okay. and I looked around and there was this kid walking by and I said, Hey, 
cut these off. <laughs> yes, a blood trail. So he, he takes out this knife, cuts the athletic tape so my shin guards fall off. And then about that time, this guy walks up and he goes, hey, are you Alan Branch? And I go, yeah. He goes, you're next. <laughs> Hands me these gloves. You don't know if they're weighted, loaded. Yeah, yeah. So I run down to the ring. There are no steps. You have to crawl, like climb into the ring. <laughs> the ropes are actual ropes like you would get at Home Depot. Okay. And the bell was a hammer with a pot. And the guy held it up to a mic. And went, <laughs> Ding! So, and then when you got in the ring, the floor was a spongy wrestling ring. Uh-huh. So after about twelve seconds, my legs went. Mm. Yep. Yeah. So that was bad man contest. So basically, it was sort of a free for all that was set up where um, you're going to see if you can fight or not. Really. They were like real. Yeah. F- like I've seen some of yours on Facebook and stuff, and they were like real. Like they were tough fights. Like they were good. So now, because of the commission and stuff, like fights are so much more regularly sanctioned that when you go to them, every now and then, like Barstool has one, mm-hmm. they do, and they bought it to Myrtle Beach, and we went, mm-hmm. and it was not what I saw when, like, Alan had fights. You know what I mean? Yeah, These yeah. were like, they would swing for 10 seconds, and then, like, literally hands on their knees, oh, tired. Yeah. Like, it was like a slop fest. Like, back in the day, like, the real fighters went to Tough Man before there was, like, tons of boxing. Like, now you can go to an MMA event, probably in North or South Carolina every other month, you know, wow. or a kickboxing event yeah. or a boxing yeah. event. Like they have point kickboxing. Like, I don't think that was a thing back then. No, yeah. it was tough, man. Every week. How similar was terrifying. it to a blood sport? <laughs> uh, well, you couldn't like, well, you weren't supposed to take down fight on the ground. We've done all of it. I've been okay. tackled. We've taken guys to the ground in the, t- which was supposed to be boxing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just kind of a melee and very quick. And okay. Very fast. So the first one that I won was they said was the biggest bloodbath they'd ever seen. Oh my goodness. Six, You're like the real life Frank Duke. <laughs> no, look, okay. it was pretty cool. Six people went to the hospital in one night. So you don't usually see that in an MMA no, fight. No. Yeah. Six went to the hospital. One with a completely broken jaw. I mean, these mm-hmm. guys were obliterated. And I love that you prefaced that with, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. <laughs> no, winning, Six people went to the hospital, man. It was awesome. Knowing that I won that one and came out yeah. relatively unscathed, That was cool. So how did that transition into coaching for you? Well, that particular event, me and a friend that we trained together, we we were known to be fighting, but we weren't winning. And then we started winning. And then there was a guy in the stands. I'd started a martial arts school, but we weren't really, just us were fighting. This guy came up, he goes, I need to train with y'all. He was Hmm. 42 at the time. He had fought in tough mans for 15 years, had never won. He trained with us. He won five in a row, including the big one. The big one in Asheville, the big one. And he won five. Wow, in a I'm row. 42 right now. That yeah. would be like me. It's not too late. Right now, going Forget into Caleb's win. ambitions, we're going yes. with Kevin. Yes. Yeah, you're well, the higher belt. In is that possible? Okay, <laughs> I do. I okay. Well, his name is Spencer Tart. And he let was, me talk to my wife. He did a. He was also. He did great. And uh, he kept fighting. He was like 58, 59, and fought like some kind of exhibition. Oh he's my just, goodness. He's just tough. But that started it, and then other students started wanting to compete, and then it grew and grew and grew and grew. Yeah, why did you... I didn't know any of this, which is fun. The same thing with uh, Baby Hulk last week. I had no idea. Well, I'm glad you said that, because I was going to ask you that. I was going to yeah, ask yeah, you, yeah. Like, no, did I you don't know, know any, of this. any of this. So how long did you coach like full-time, and why did you kind of decide to back off and, and, and just go with your, you know, the Jerry Maguire thing where you take on, you know, <laughs> one client and go all the way? Well, we, we sold a facility that we had mm-hmm. in, in Winston okay. area. And moved here. Yeah. And then when I got here, I was kind of like, what do I want to do? So do I want to do anything? So I started looking around and it's kind of funny because the, the gyms in the area, I'd call them and I'd be like, look, I know what it sounds like. People have always called me with this. I'm just looking for somewhere to stay involved. They wouldn't even give me the time of the day. Yeah. Like wouldn't even talk to me. I'm like, Dude, you got I, you got snubbed at Salty Dog the first time you went in, didn't you? Little, not bad, because you took me in. Yes, I so did. So it wasn't bad. Yeah. But I understand it because in most martial arts schools, they're either scared of anybody knows what they're doing, or they're used to people who have no clue what they're doing, talking like they do know what they're doing and wasting their time. Mm-hmm. I, I've been there. So, but I tried to be like, here, here's some links. Here's some links of me training with Joe Lewis. Here's some links of some fights. You know, take a look. They wouldn't even... One second, Joe, what do you, when you have yeah. a coach approach you, like what's going through your mind? Well, I mean, it, well, for me, it wasn't, it's not like Alan solicited me, you know, you kind of reached out to me and it wasn't even like he was telling you to do that. It was more like a, Hey, like, is this something that and I was like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> right. And then it was like, well, I love Kevin. <laughs> Fear of man. I don't want to like tell him no. So we'll do this. 
as a favor. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. Was, like, you I did was, actually say that. I remember yeah, yeah. you said that. You it was like, a pity session for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like five minutes in, I was like, oh, man, like, okay, this is awesome. And, and then it like, was like, Kevin should actually be hey, managing yeah, professional fighters. Yeah. And then it was like, uh, I was like, we need to do this again. And then, and then Zach came and then we did it again. And I'm like, I'm not crazy. Like, this guy's really good. He's like, yeah. And like, you know, and then <laughs> now, I mean, now it's not even a question, but, uh, yeah, the material's out there too. Like, like the first thing I did before we worked was like go on YouTube and Facebook and stuff. Right. Just because like, uh, you know, I, I, I'm always super cautious because I've had some really bad coaching in the past, like terrible. And that, we'll say that for like our story time podcast when we do those little snippets, but like down to like guys not being anywhere close to who they said they were or like coming to your fights and, you know, falling asleep in the back room, like just crazy stuff. Yeah. So I'm like, uh, kind of like a, like a, <laughs> you know, like a, gun shy you know yeah, yeah, so yeah. it was like uh yeah it's like that and especially with striking because with instagram and social media i feel like it's like one of the, the easiest things for people to like fake the funk now and so you actually get in there and like you see that jab coming at you you feel it and you're like mm -hmm. oh man like you've thrown a million jabs in your life or no, probably way more than that but you know what i mean like and, but jujitsu is just like that it, it people are still in that phase where they think like oh you meet a black belt in jiu-jitsu they're going to be great they could go defend themselves in a real life situation that is not the case. Like, look mm -hmm. at that, uh, the fight we watched a couple weeks ago with Islam. There's a clip of him talking about, uh, actually another guy in the UFC who probably should be a black belt, but he was like, he's like, brother, who give this guy a black belt? They need to take it away. <laughs> take it away. That's not like, wow. but like, it's kind of true. Like, maybe not that, that level, but you know, it, it's the same thing in jiu-jitsu. It's just, uh, people are still, we're not far removed from every black belt in jiu-jitsu being good that you still think you're going to walk into a school and learn self-defense and learn, mm -hmm. you know, something you go take in a fight where like, probably seven out of 10 schools, you're not going to get that. And uh, kickboxing has just been around so much longer that it's probably a little more watered down when you meet them. Yeah. It's guys that have no combat experience. They've never been in a tough man. They've never been punched in the face hard. And they're like, well, I came up with this cool drill. You're like, do you even know if it works? Like, you yeah. don't. So uh, I'm always going to try about that for sure. I see. And yeah. that makes sense. So kickboxing is your thing. If And we've had some discussions on the show about this fairly frequently. In your opinion, what is the best martial art if you could only train one for street level self defense? You know, bar fights, whatever. Hopefully, our guys aren't getting in bar fights, but you know that. <laughs> Don't that go kind to of bars. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Yes, well, <laughs> right, and I would say the same thing. But what would you? What, what's your opinion? What, what's the What's the most efficient martial art for self defense? You know, I love that. So I'm quite a bit older than you guys. So I've been doing this a while. And so I have black belts in. He basically just said whatever we think doesn't matter. No, I didn't no. say that. I'm just <laughs> prefacing how this background was gotten. Yeah. So I have black belts in karate, taekwondo, jujitsu, uh, Russian sambo, Krav Maga, and then with Joe Lewis, it, it, it's his system, but it, I like the verbiage non classical combative methodology. Oh. So I like that. <laughs> That's so, a mouthful. Uh, that, uh, so it's a. It's Why didn't we name our podcast that? Yeah. <laughs> because it's too hard to say five times. Yeah. <laughs> so. So I've got a good background to see sort of what's Sure, fun. that's why we're asking you. So here's the thing. Like, is it really the style or is it the method of training? So here's the problem. Krav Maga, Krav Maga for example, is really cool. But most of the people taking Krav Maga are never going to make that stuff work because mm -hmm. they can't handle the number. Now, we're shifting now. So mm -hmm. a martial art martial arts is a generic term used to describe all fighting arts armed or unarmed so you take all total classification so the problem is the first thing that happens is an adrenaline dump mm -hmm. so the very first thing so we we like to start if i'm training somebody for self-defense we go through a wolfing phase so the wolfing phase would be like are you looking at me like it starts with that and then your gut reaction is either fight or flight or freeze and yeah. most people are like whoa and they yeah. get nervous start of the adrenal dump under an adrenaline dump, your mind can only process about four or five things at once. You get tunnel vision. You have a loss of fine motor skills. Mm -hmm. You get auditory exclusion. See, you can't, you can't do that. Like, like, here's a good example. Let's say that you're really, really hungry and you need to eat right now. And I'm yelling at you while you're trying to eat and somebody hands you an Olive Garden menu. You're like, uh, what do I use? Uh, I have a, um, uh, that's how martial arts are. Traditional Taekwondo is 3,003 moves. That's why okay. it's important to have your go-to item on every menu. Yeah, I think yeah. I will throw the move <laughs> you, you out. You throw a PT's menu in front of me in that situation, 
Eight I'm ounce, good. just cheese. But see, that's I'm the thing. That. You've done the reps. Yes. Simple. That's what it comes okay. down to. Right. I think that's where we're headed. Right. Yeah, yeah. So here's, here's the thing. I think that all the martial arts have some cool stuff. Yep. Like, obviously, a chokehold. Win. Yeah. High, high reward, low risk. Straight right hand to the chin. Ah. High reward, low risk. Jump spinning kick. <laughs> very <Yeah. laughs> low reward high risk that's why it's a highlight right? yeah. it's rare that's what i always tell people when they train that stuff so here's what i think i think that all of it can work but what you need is you need a bridge to carry you from normalcy from normalcy to chaos mm -hmm. so uh what you do is you, you need a bridge something to carry you from things are going on right now to things are crazy you know? That's the thing too, is like the, the martial arts that people practice that are only theoretical, it's impossible to call it self-defense because like you're not able to practice it. Every, if you kickbox hard every day and you've had that adrenaline of being the new guy in the gym or maybe the coach puts you in the ring and you've got a spar, everybody's watching, you're way more prepared for a real life situation because you've had to do it under pressure when you're doing it for real. Same with, uh, you know, wrestling, mm -hmm. you're out there on the mat, like you've actually done it under adrenaline, jujitsu, same thing, like. Some of the stuff where you train it, you're not able to do it hard or you can't sustain the repetitions you need to do, then, then you're, you know, and that's the same thing with, like, we see it with jiu-jitsu. People say, well, that's a great martial art for self-defense because you can do it hard all the time, but people that don't want to roll, yeah, you can have your purple belt. Are you going to be okay if somebody comes up behind you and bear hug? No, absolutely not. Well, there's another mm. problem. Before we start, you are putting on your gloves and you're warming up and you shadow box a little bit, do some warm-up exercises on the mat. Okay, we don't have that. Somebody walks up, they stick their finger in your face and shove your chest, your back hits a brick wall, your head bounces off the brick wall and they throw a sucker punch. Good luck with your jujitsu and kickboxing. Yeah, what's your first instinct? So, so here's, here's the point I was gonna make before. Well, what do you do if so, they do that? So here's what, I, here's what we do. I think, like I said, you need a bridge to happen from things are fine to, oh, crap's hitting the fan right now to get to my kickboxing, jujitsu, whatever I do. So we call it outside 90. And it, Joe and I demonstrated and talked about this. Oh, I've seen you do this. You've got YouTube videos that, that yeah. where you show so this, if right? So you, if you take your, if you hold your arm at 90 degree angle and you let somebody grab you in a bear hug and squeeze it, you can't resist them. But if they take their hand outside 90 degrees, I've held a 260 pound guy out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hand. It's the same as like framing. framing. And yeah, right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. now what if, like you can't walk around, who you mean? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. What if your gut reaction was yeah. just, whoa, with a flinch? So this would be a bad flinch, closing my eyes. But if I felt like Joe was a threat and both hands go up and my, whoa, whoa hey, man, hey. Watch so, so. <laughs> But what's happened is you've created a, a, a wedge between you so that if he runs into this, yeah. I kind of know where I'm at for just a second so that I can set up what it is I do. Is it a knee? Is it a takedown? Some kind of rear drag? I give myself a little break. So the best self-defense, they're all pretty good. All right. The bigger question is, how do you put yourself in a position where you can use it? I got you. I've I seen got guys you. Okay. like eat a knee and be rocked on their feet and then shoot a double, put them on his butt, you know, hang out in his guard for a second. And then you talk to them after the fight and they're like, oh, I, I don't remember any of that. <laughs> but they, they did. They shot so many double legs. Yeah, that, it's that's, just instant. That's their first reaction yeah. under stress, but most people aren't going to be like that. So when you're coaching a MMA fighter to be able to react and do these things, what are some of the challenges that you run into? So, just in, 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 with in fighters general, in general. In general, dealing with fighters, I would say, more than building a reaction, because you know they're going to put the reps in, I would say more of the struggles are just coaching fighters. What's okay. fighters are crazy. Okay, so... for Well, then what are they? What are the well, struggles? Here's the thing. If you've I'm got, good. Let's and I'm, it. I'm literally, y'all are both big boys. So I'm not saying this just to be saying it. I mean it. If you're dealing with a Joe Selecki, yeah, there is no challenge. It's simply here it is. And he does the work, but as a general rule, fighters are very arrogant or they're just, they are, they think they know everything they uh, are. They don't like to listen. Some are lazy. And what, what are done. some of the ways that that would come out? Like practically, how do you right, so, see that? So we had a pro. All right. Here we and go. this guy fought Roy Jones, 12 yep. rounds. Okay. Okay. He got to us. We're training him. We're supposed to work out at nine o'clock. I walk in at 850. Nobody there. At nine o'clock, he walks in. Cologne, gold <laughs> chains, dressed up. Sits down on the edge of the ring, starts chatting. I'm like, mm -hmm. we start at nine o'clock. Yeah, you should have been there at 8.30. We start yeah. at nine o'clock. 
Well, l- let me get let me get ready. 35 minutes later, we're starting. I turn around and walk out. I've had lots of pros do that. Well, let's hit pads for some conditioning. How about this? Go do your own conditioning and come back in here so we can work on skill work because I'm not conditioning today. Today mm-hmm. is a training session with me. Training sessions are not me just killing you in a conditioning workout. Mm-hmm. So go do it yourself. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, just the, the sheer like, okay, well, I've already learned everything. Mm-hmm. There's every, well, I haven't. You know, I haven't learned everything. I'm constantly learning. But what I need is an eye. Like I know that having an eye on you to say, oh, by the way, did you know that we can do this now? Oh, mm-hmm. something new to learn? Let's do that. Mm-hmm. A lot of fighters get caught in their way of doing things. And I'll just say with the fact that there's an arrogance factor with a lot. Okay. And, but I Which is it. funny because learning new stuff is what keeps it fresh. Mm-hmm. Like I was super refreshed last camp because I'm going, I'm not even worried about my opponent or the deadline or this because there's so much stuff to just enjoy. Like, I think I texted you a million times being like, I'm in love with martial arts again. We're thinking about, mm-hmm. you know, the different, the different, you know, ranges and the different, you know, oh, well, you could do this to occupy this lead hand, you know, all these different things where you're like, oh man, I'm not even like, I'm not worried about the fight or anything else. That should be the exciting. Like, if you're, I think the other for, I mean, I coach too, you know, is dealing with fighters who don't love the sport or not, ah. not even the sport, but don't love the martial arts. Like, so then why are they doing it? Exactly. Cause sometimes, sometimes, which is mind blowing to me. Cause I was terrible my whole life. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're naturally good at it. And they're like, this is just what I'm good at. So like, this is what I do. And you're like, there's somebody that, that has been sitting in a gym for 15 years trying to get good at this. Who started, maybe they started when they're 40. They're like, they would kill to be in your position. And, and you're just, you know, showing up and, you know, let's do some conditioning today. You're like, you should have done that. You should have ran your sprint. You, no one should need to wake you out of bed to go run sprints to fight this guy for a great world-class opportunity. Right. You know, and you right. see it all the time, all the time. Well, and people don't like. There, the number of fighters, fighters there are versus the number of people who train is it's a minuscule comparison. Okay. So you have more people who are out there wanting to learn and develop less people who are wanting to become actual fighters. And they're way right? better students. Usually. Yeah. And that was going to be my point. The, a lot of times the people who just want to learn are better students than mm-hmm. the actual fighters. Cause you know, I always say that there's two ways you can learn to fight. You can just get thrown in a cage and just fight over and over and over until you figure it out, mm-hmm. which could work. And you end up with a lot of bruises. That's kind of what happened. You did, right? And no yeah. brain cells. Well, the difference with me was I did that in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Didn't work out so well. Mm-hmm. Met Joe Lewis, instantly started winning, I see. winning, 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 winning without all of the clubbing that, w- that went on in sparring. Mm-hmm. We still sparred, but it's kind of like, it's like, let's take, a, let's take something like a punch. So let's say you learn to throw a basic jab. Right. And as mm-hmm. soon as you get the jab down now, like if it was Joe and we were learning the jab, we'd learn the punch. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now I'm like, all right, Joe, throw that punch at me and see what it feels like. Boom. Okay. Now really try to hit me. Boom. Step with your foot. Boom. So he learns a punch. Then he learns to defend the punch. Then we drill it where he takes that punch and puts it into action in a controlled environment. Then he develops that. Then we progress forward. And now all of a sudden, phew, Joe's got this dynamite left jab Right. versus Hey, Joe, here's how you throw a jab. Stick your hand out there, hit him with these knuckles. Go, y'all yep. spar. Yep. Wow. That's, that's a typical boxing gym. Yeah, that is yeah. 100% a boxing gym. So, so now, if that. <laughs> if that. If you're not just in the back, hitting the bag. You know? So now it's very tactical. Like, why do you throw your punch like this? Like, the elbow comes up first because if the elbow swings out first, I can see that coming. Mm-hmm. Now, we do speed drills where you learn to stand right in front of somebody and see if you can pick off their fastest punch. He's learned it now. Anybody we step in front of now, he sees it. If I do anything other than let the hand move before the elbow, I see that stuff coming with one eye. I can look over there and block your (laughs) punch. Right. But if you do it correctly, you got to be on your toes. So what's happening? Joe is learning a basic punch, the form of the shot. I am learning how to read what it looks like when a punch comes at Mm -hmm. me. And then then we trade. Well, that is a dynamite way of developing some fight skills. And then guess what? Joe takes it and says, tonight is sparring. Let me put that to work. Then he applies it. I well, I say too, the other thing is like, it's also a problem as a fighter with coaches is like when you run into coaches who aren't obsessed, you know what I mean? Like this, like, like I think a good fighter should be obsessed. Like you should have to tell him, Hey, go home and don't watch any fighting tonight. Stop. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, but I think it should be the same. Like all of the coaches that I now work with are obsessed. You know, mm-hmm. he is definitely like that. Uh, Jeff Jimmo is like he was saying last night, we were talking about something. Somebody, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm watching wrestling tonight. I'm like, you've been here all day. You're going to go home and watch Have college Have you ever met wrestling? Jeff Jimmo? Not yet. Oh, man. We'll cross paths in Charlotte for sure. 
But uh, we need to get uh, Jeff to come down for you know a beach weekend and do a podcast and do a podcast. <laughs> and then we have two a weekend you. nonstop yeah. of just training. Yeah. All weekend. But it's like that'd be fun. It, 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 it's the same thing on, on each side of the, the token because sometimes you meet coaches who are just like same thing. Like I'm just good at this. You know. Yeah. Here's your move. Enjoy your move. Here's the clock. Train. You know. <laughs> and I think a lot of boxing coaches because there's not a lot of money in it get burnt out as well because maybe they don't have any other income or job. Sometimes it's better to meet somebody who this isn't their. They're everything where they're like struggling and burnt out too. You know, that can be another thing, especially with fighters. I told, I was all in with it. And then it starts to get a little, you know, you start to have those wolves at the door of the bills mm-hmm. and the this and the that. And you're like, all right, I'm 26. I don't have any real life. I have a wife. Like she'd like to go on a vacation sometime in the next 15 years. Uh, so I'll see guys now where maybe back then I'd be like, he's not all in. Now I, uh, we got a guy, one of the guys who trained in Charlotte joined the fire department. And one of the guys was like, oh, maybe he's not. I'm like, that's the smartest thing he could have done. Yeah. Because he, now his fiance isn't going to be pressing him about we don't have health insurance. Now you have health insurance. You have a flexible schedule. You can train. And now you're going to be here strictly out of passion and wanting to be here. Like this is the best thing you could do. I think something. Yeah. But that's why I think it's so great now. Like this, you know, Alan's not texting me going, do you have a fight yet? Like, can I, can, I need, I need you to, you know, you know, I need you to fight so I can, it's not, it's not your everything. You know, he's got a fan of the stuff. So, uh, but then being willingly obsessed with it, I think is a huge thing for fighters and coaches. When you are training these guys what are you looking for in terms of intangibles for for a fighter like like if you're evaluating a guy and you're thinking am i going to work with this guy or is this guy just not unfortunately worth my time you know type of thing like what are you what are you looking for in a in a fighter that says to you this guy can make it to the big time well the 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 first thing would be the existing attributes Okay. So you always hear somebody go, oh, that guy's just super athletic. Mm-hmm. What they mean is this guy has freakish, he has freakish attributes. Mm-hmm. What is that? Speed, timing, rhythm, power. Uh, he has these things built in. Like mm-hmm. he just is that guy. Which those, of those does Joe have? <laughs> uh, we're, still trying to find, we're still digging. Well, well, we're curious. still trying to find out. <laughs> so Joe, Joe has, he has good power. He has a natural uh, aggressiveness. Like when you put together, a, like, like even a, like a, some kind of entry type peekaboo movement, it's already naturally very aggressive. Stubborn, I think stubbornness. It, well, no, oh, what I was going to say is literally <laughs> every Take a compliment, literally everything I say, uh-huh. he applies. Mm. So uh, it's like Drago, whatever he hits, he destroys. <laughs> so no, whenever I tell him he's got it, like he's going to train it. And when he comes back next yeah. time, he's got that down. So you're already in shape, like phenomenal conditioning, uh, really good strength, very good aggressiveness. In the beginning from a, uh, and this is striking only, of course, because you hit the ground, it's a different world. But uh, stand up, he did not have a very good release. Mm-hmm. Like when he'd go to swing, I'm like, no, Joe, no, Joe, no, Joe. I see it. Mm-hmm. Now it's like, why? look out, Joe, back off, Joe. You mm-hmm. know, it's too, it's faster. So you begin to develop the attributes. But I would say this, if I have somebody that will listen, mm-hmm. like, uh, can I call out our guy that was there the other day? I was just about to say, okay, talk so, about that. It's so funny you do that. Yeah. So, yeah. The, so the other day, uh, if Nick's listening, Nick shout, Mass? shout yeah. out to All him. Right. Cause I prepped him and said, I'm like, Hey, oh. like, I want you to come help me, blah, blah, blah. But like, you're going to feel really stupid. Uh, just cause it's all new. And like, you know, Alan's really good at that. Like he's really good at like pointing out where he, he got nothing but compliments. It was just <laughs> me. That, <laughs> it was me to start yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here's the point. Every time I look, and I've only met Nick like once or twice, yeah. maybe. And, and I didn't know well, that. That's was unfortunate. Who was he, the entire time, his eyes were right on me. Mm-hmm. He never looked away. So yeah. never, no matter what I said, he was like, huh? Yes, sir. Huh? Mm-hmm. And I said, I'll take that all day. Mm-hmm. You get that guy. And that's how Joe is. You get that. Everything else can be taught okay. because I understand the mechanics of teaching it properly. So, so it's not hard to teach somebody that, that has that. So probably, you know, uh, an, a, an attention span and a willingness to learn. Obviously, you're already strong and fast in a fight game universe. Mm-hmm. You're in the top UFC. I mean, you're, you're obviously that. Yeah. So you already have that. So you have to kind of look past that and go, okay, so what do we got now? Eh, we got somebody that's going to listen to what you say. You got somebody that's going to investigate. Mm-hmm. And somebody that's not going to be like afraid to ask a question. Like, here's a, here's a problem in a martial arts school. Whoever the sensei is cannot be questioned. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. Or the Sifu. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the chain puncher. Yeah. See, if you're, you e- said it, not if me. you're eating seafood, you're fine. You can question everything. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have a seafood, 
He can't be quiet. Well, here's my thing. If I can't th- if I can't do it to you, mm-hmm. why are we even teaching it? Because mm-hmm. if I can't do yep. it, how can I expect him to do it? Sure. And then when I say throw it hard, I'm like, Joe, throw it at me. Throw it hard. Like, I need you to know what it feels like. I need you to, but if it doesn't work, it's got to be like, I don't think I can make that work. All right, mm. let's try that again. Oh, uh, maybe what well, you're right. Maybe you're, you can't live in this world of theories in what we do. There's yeah. no way you can't because it's got to be applied. It has to be applied. So okay. all of martial arts, a, a lot of martial arts are based on principles that can't be enforced or proven. I'll now, kill you. If I throw this strike, that's my favorite. You know, I can't show you because it would just hurt you too oh, much. Instructors actually say that. Oh yeah. That you used know, to be, not we, anymore. Probably. I hope you know but, what our, our, we, are, okay. You guys missed this. Okay. Nineties. 80s, 90s. Was I the, did not miss the 80s no, and 90s. No, no, no. Hold tight. This was the it's time. my two favorite decades. This ever. was the time when people actually showed up at your school yep. to challenge you. Yep. Okay. And when, ah. you would, when you would talk to somebody, they would say, I can't do that. It's too deadly. Yep. And, I, and I'd say, how many people have you killed? <laughs> and then there was, I don't like I'd go, talk well, about I'll, take, I'll take my chances. Yeah, I'll take know? my chances. You do what you do and I'll take my chances. I'll <laughs> yeah. see if it works. That was how, so in, in, the, in the 90s and early 2000s, like actually uh, one of the guys that has a school out in Colorado, he trains a lot of UFC fighters and stuff. He said that too. He's like, as a blue belt, he's like, that was like, I would go into the class because you didn't know what day you were going to have to step up and have a challenge match. He goes, that's how you got students. Mm. The other martial artists would come in and be like, this doesn't work. And they'd be like, you know, Kevin, you're up and you guys fight. And you're like, I only know jiu-jitsu. I don't throw any punches. You're like, yep, clinch him and take him down. He's going to try to kick it. And then they sign up for the gym. You're like, yeah, that's, yeah. Cra- that's a crazy Wild West era. <clears throat> All right, yeah. so you want to hear the Or greatest. I jump guard and tear their knee out and uh, <laughs> right, so then they never come back anyway. So Listen to this it. for the ultimate. This is, so uh, there's a guy, and this is like 25 years ago, and he shows up at my school. So John, about 25 years ago, shows up at my school and he says, I talked to Joe Lewis. I want to get a black belt ranking under Joe Lewis. And he came, he told me to come see you. I was like, okay. So I picked literally the worst fighter we had. And (laughs) he wiped the floor with John. Oh, okay. And, and I was like, dang. So then you're like, how now John's tough now he's tough. And I was like, okay, what's What's going to happen here? John had a school Mm -hmm. about 15, 20 minutes away. Mm -hmm. After that happened, he goes back closes his school, <laughs> tells his students, this stuff doesn't work. I'm going to go learn what works. Comes to my school, becomes incredible. He's very good. We both got our black belts in Krav Maga from Israel. He still runs the Krav Maga program. And I will say he's probably, I know there's a lot of guys out there. John is probably the best Krav Maga instructor in the Southeast United States. Wow. He is good. Like he can break stuff down. And where's he located now? In Winston-Salem. Okay. So uh, he's fantastic. Mm-hmm. But the point of the story is that's the example of somebody who is humble. And he goes in and goes, wait a minute, this stuff isn't working. I'm going to fix that. Right. So what he do? He learned and then he applied it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Because what you'll see, I feel like in most martial arts is you'll go back to the school and be like, no one's ever allowed to go train over there. Mm-hmm. That place and then make up some lot, you know. Alan's beating all the students. Do not go train over there because oh yeah, there was some of that. They don't want they don't want you to go learn and realize there's something better, you know. And right, that's that's true humility. Yeah, that's pretty cool. There was a lot of that. Now you were a pastor at some point too, right? Yeah, and that was fun because I I was a involvement. <laughs> it's minister, always fun. <laughs> well, involvement minister at a church, which comes with its own challenges, but also started a Krav Maga program in the church. In the church, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And people are like, oh, I don't know if you should be doing yeah, that. You weren't part of the, the fight church movement, though, right? Not of familiar life. with that. And I'd appreciate it if you'd stay out of my personal affairs. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I never. No, heard. that was a big thing where there were churches for a while there that were using like cage fighting and training for cage fighting as like an outreach ministry to kind of build men and things like that. You're not, you don't know anything about I that. I don't know anything about it. Okay. All right. But you did build a Krav Maga program that's yeah awesome. we did Krav Maga and kickboxing and you know we had some so you have those some insights some I, mean, battles you, down there. I think it makes you unique because you have this overlap though of like caring for people's souls right but also caring for their fight technique and their ability to defend themselves and so if I were to ask you well it's not if I were to ask you because I'm going to ask you let me <laughs> this is not a hypothetical <laughs> since I am asking you uh, what role does taking care of the soul have to do with a fighter uh, in training? 
Uh, probably the, the, there's, this is a multifaceted. Well, let's answer. do it. We okay. got, we got a few so, minutes. So one side of it would be. As long as uh, you let us get some words in here and there too. Are you saying I'm talking? Yeah, I know. I'm just saying, okay, you're doing great. Don't let's keep it up. S- look, That's I will all. sick Joe Selecki on. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I was going to ask you both what's hard, what's harder being my pastor or my coach. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just yeah, kidding. Well, we, we have a support group for that. So I Good. think it's, it's, you know, as with all things, it's finding balance, mm-hmm. you know, because do you need, we'll just use the term Christian as a reference point. Sure. Do you need to be a fighter to be a Christian? No. When you're Christian, uh, do you need to be a fighter? Well, maybe not physically, uh, yeah. but does being a fighter make you a Christian? No. Does being a Christian make you a fighter? No. But can you be a Christian and be a fighter? Absolutely. So how does that work? Well, if you look at it as any activity, Mm-hmm. You're finding balance. So what is your balance? You're, I like to train. I like to take care of this. I'm good to people when I do that. I uh, treat everybody with respect. You got a Joe Selecki type environment in front of all these people who are watching a fighter who doesn't have to act like a crazy psycho, clean cut. That's why I originally stopped watching UFC because everybody's nuts. Mm. You find one guy that looks like he's pretty cool. You're like, okay, here's a guy I can follow. I can pursue. So he sets forth a different uh, image than a lot of what you're dealing with, right? Sure. So, you know, I think for martial arts, and again, this is multi, a lot of different ways we could go. Martial arts and church attract weird people. <laughs> you know? Okay. I, I know, Where are you I, going with this, no, Alan? Me and, meaning that people are searching. If like this yeah. void. They're looking they like for void. something and they're like, well, I'm going to mystically summon the universe. I'm going to follow the stars. I'm going to learn some ancient Chinese. Sea. No, no, let's forget all that. Well, I mean, except at our church on Sundays, we, well, we teach all of that. I'm sure you do. <laughs> so, <laughs> anybody listening, that is not, <laughs> not what they do. No. It's so, not. um, so you, you f- fighting, if you're a fighter, you can go a dark way mm-hmm. because everybody yes. that's a fighter has something when something happens, your brain clicks into another mode and it mm-hmm. can go darker than what you typically are. Okay. So finding some balance by knowing where your roots are based on your worldview to help keep some of that in check. Are you saying that fighting has to take you to a dark place? No. It can. It can. It can. Yeah. Okay. And it will. It will. If you're not, if you're not grounded like that in your faith, you, it definitely will. Okay. I, and I, I, yeah. I would and so that would be advantage one then if we're, if we're oh, counting yeah, them off. 100%. Advantage one is what you're saying is this balance, what it provides well, is it provides you an opportunity and, and even a capacity not to go to that dark place. Yeah. Let me reference the guy that put, took me in that fight, but Jared Gordon had yeah. talked about this recently in an interview. Yeah. That's his he, blood right there. I think it might be mine. I'm not sure. We had you it. wiped your face with that. It? Looks like no. A I think it just dripped. I don't know. It was a oh, mess. Okay. Right. But um, we'll get it tested. No, but he he was doing an interview for something. One of his last fights, and he was like, "Oh, like I don't even. I don't. MMA is like a like a burden to me. You know, like I have to. I have to do this. this sure. isn't even, and people were getting on him, and then on a podcast, he was clarifying. He's like, "No, what I mean is like, this is not going to fill any of those voids in my life. That, mm-hmm. and he put it so well because it's actually the, the exact lesson I think I." fully understood after losing to him was like, I'm not gonna, it's not gonna, winning is not gonna fill the void. Losing isn't gonna make that void bigger. He's like, what you're searching for is fulfillment in a relationship with Jesus, you know? And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and he was saying, aside from that, he's like, the only things that make me feel like that void is filled besides, you know, like prayer and, and having that relationship. He's like, are the things that are godly things. Like he was saying, like being with his wife and like, you know, living a life that was like, Close, bring him closer to, to God. Sure. And uh, that's huge. But I think like Alan said, like everyone comes in, a lot of people are coming into the gym and, and they're not looking for a way to discipline their flesh or to get in shape to assist them in their walk. It's this is my, put plug this into that gap right here and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, let it be my answer to everything. And then you'll go real dark mm-hmm. because now you're putting your faith in something of the world, which just like everything else, you join a, a gym and the, the owner isn't a good guy or the coach and leads you down a, you know, now you're, you know, now you're worse off than when you started. Do you have any other, I mean, what would your advice be to a guy who is wanting to get into fighting? How would you encourage him to balance, to find that balance? Well, if you start with the worldview. Mm-hmm. What uh, worldview? Christian. Okay. So, so uh, just clarify. If, if you start with a yet. Christian worldview, mm-hmm. then it's pretty easy to build upon that because if you go with a, uh, all, all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial, you know, yes. you, you know, but you start with, 
Okay, so here's my worldview. This is where I'm rooted. Mm -hmm. I sure do like martial arts. I think I could be good at that. I think I'll start training. I still have my original worldview. I know what I believe. I know where my faith is in, but now I pick up this hobby, just like this guy who picks up his hobby and becomes a fisherman. Yeah. So it's just a hobby. It's not right. a lifestyle. It isn't right. your, it, now in, in, in a case of a professional fighter, it's a job. Yeah. Yep. Now not your identity though. Right, right. Right. You have a job. Your job is not what your worldview, where your identity comes from. Sure. So what's the real difference? Right. So I pick up a hobby to learn. This happens to be a cool hobby because what does it do? Gets me in better shape, improves my attributes, meet some friends. That's generally where your friend circle is going to be. That's where you start to have and a provides people that you get to talk about Christ with. Yes. Yeah. And every now and then it's you can be on an beat. amazing podcast. Yeah. yeah. This one, right? Yes, okay. Correct. Yeah. I think what you said really gets to the heart of it is you're saying it, it, the question is where are you rooted? Mm. You know, are you rooted in your identity as a fighter or are you rooted as in your identity in Christ? And I think that what we're trying to pitch here, and I know that not everybody listening or watching is going to agree with this, but we would encourage you if you don't to, to give it a try, but that if you find your rooting in something bigger than fighting, in, in, such as in the creator of the universe, then that's going to have a profound impact on the way that you train, on the way that you interact with the people that you train with, and on the way that you... Uh, you go about looking at fighting, you know, is it, do you have to go to that dark place? You guys are saying no, right? No, I, I've been watching a lot of guys that I, you know, not, I won't say grew up some like Frankie Edgar fights tonight, guys that I watch as a young fighter or even as a young kid who are still around fighting are all at the tail end now. Mm -hmm. And I listen to a lot of the interviews just cause I'm not going to be fans of guys I'm fighting that I'm peers with, you know, I'm kind of sure. watching the last generation. Yeah. And it's kind of because it's the death of their fighting career. It's the end. It's like watching someone on their deathbed almost, you know, and you hear them talk and they're saying all these things that they would not have said 10 years uh, ago. Yeah. So they're saying things like, you know, Frank Yeager is fighting his retirement fight. Is it so important to you this and that? He goes, I want to win this fight. Like I've ever wanted to win any fight. Like I wanted to win the fight I got in in fifth grade, right. but uh, capping off my career is not going to be good or bad based on the outcome of Saturday night. And you're like, you would have never said that five years ago. Yeah. You know, imagine being able to have that at 29 going into your prime because and not because I had to come to that conclusion of, oh, up and down and this and that. And now I can appreciate the last fight. Well, no, because I know my worth isn't defined in that, mm. you know, because you come in with that, that worldview and, and I'm not looking. And then you hear people say the same thing, like, oh, for years I was worried about the fans and this and that. Now I realize none of that matters. It's my family. And well, where was that 10 years ago? You know, mm. and the other side, you see guys uh, who lose their rooting along the way, who came in as, as Christian guys who are like, you know, I, I was only able to do this by the grace of God. And now they're like, you know, I have a million sponsors and I'm big on uh, my beliefs and my motivation, my visualization. You're like, man, you were the guy with the first thing in your Instagram bio was Christian. And now it's your sponsors and your mental coach. You know, mm -hmm. what happened? You started to believe in you and not, you lost your role, your rooting, you know? Um, it's tough to see. It is. And that's why I just encourage people to, to, to give it a chance. Like, I mean, people don't understand the importance of it until I think they get into it. And then they're like, Oh, like this opens up a whole new window to my worldview. But just like, just like training of all kinds, regardless of the style. Yes. It's still a process. Hmm. The day you become a fighter, you are not automatically the greatest fighter. <laughs> The day you become a Christian, everybody knows, good gosh, you're going to continue to do stupid stuff for the rest of your life. But it's the process of, am I trying to get a little better every time? And I, did, I, I made that mistake. I, mean, I can make that better. I can make that better. I'm conscious. Like, if I, you miss a training day, you're like, dang, I can't be missing training days. I'm not getting any better. You know, same thing, Christian worldview. Ah, I did that again? Yeah. That's probably yeah. not the best way to go. Yeah. Now, when you get to the point fighting where you're okay missing uh, six to eight workouts and you don't care anymore, then you got problems. If you get to the point where you're doing all these stupid things over and over and over and you have no remorse and no, no guilt, no shame, no, no, you start to have some problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So same as Miyagi would say, same, same, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. you're, you got, uh, that's what people is like, well, okay. I can't be that good. And that's really, that was really kind of the, the founding idea for this show yes. was, 100%. was the similarities between training and fighting and training in godliness well, fighting is a metaphor for life but fighting is also 
a metaphor for spiritual life. Yes. You know, yeah. especially when you think of the battle of like flesh and spirit. Absolutely. Like it's literally we're fighting every single day, yep. you know? Yep. Alan, is there anything that we didn't ask that you wish we would have asked you? If I had the winning lottery numbers for the one. Well, I know that no, that's I don't not have that. Um, no, you know, I think in a vocal setting where you could just, you tell, I want to get up and start doing stuff. Right. So, uh, you ask, you learn a lot. I mean, there's just, uh, I don't know. I thought it was pretty, pretty balanced. Okay. And you know, I'd be glad to continue it and do it again on another day. Well, we would, uh, we're going to take you up on that. We would be really glad to have you back. This was great. Uh, but Alan, it's been, it's been great having you on, man. And, uh, we hope to get you on is as much as, as much as we can and as much as you're able. So since you have people that are fighters that listen, we'll tell you how we would end our uh, training videos when I made a series of training fighter. Uh, oh, you're going to take fighters. us out like in an you outro here? No, well, you don't have to use it. I'm just saying this oh, is what yeah. I would do. I, basically, at the end, you said, remember to keep your hands up, your chin down, and thank God every day you have the strength to do one more round. And on that, we will close it out. Please stay tuned for some updates and announcements about the show. Thanks for listening and God bless.